time to pack your bags. Singapore is setting up an air travel bubble with Hong Kong without restrictions or quarantine. Trains breaking down. SMRT says it's sorry for the disruption yesterday and explains what went wrong. And a drink is not just a drink anymore. It's a whole new tasting experience. Good evening, you're watching The Big Story. Coming to you live from the Straits Times newsroom, I'm Dylan Ang. And I'm Olivia Kuei. You can subscribe to the Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. Singapore has agreed in principle to set up an air travel bubble with Hong Kong. Travellers will not be subject to quarantines or stay-home notices and there will be no restrictions on itinerary or purpose of travel. However, travellers will need to test negative for COVID-19 likely before departure. While details are still being worked out, Singaporeans could be travelling to Hong Kong in several weeks. Transport Minister Ong Yi Kang says the reopening of borders will come as a relief to many travellers. I think it's a significant step. It's a small step, but a significant one because both Hong Kong and Singapore, we are regional aviation hubs, even global aviation hubs. And for two of us to be able to control the epidemic and come together to discuss and establish this air travel bubble, I think hopefully this sets a model and a template for us to forge more of such relationships and partnerships. Basically, our, our concept is this, uh, no restrictions on, on uh, segments yeah, or on purpose of travel. So students, you know, interns, they can all go, uh, or tourists can all go. No restrictions on itinerary, no control itinerary, but replace it with tests, especially a pre-departure test. But beyond that, each territory, each party should be also free to impose your own administrative arrangements. For example, you may want an on-arrival test as well, so be it or you want trace together, uh, or, or measure temperature every day, you know, whatever that is, or a simple administrative approval, not the kind of MOM approval. So all this, I think we should have uh, independently, we can decide. Let's welcome The Straits Times News Editor, Karamjit Kaur, to take this discussion further. Hey Karam, now this is the first two-way air travel bubble between Singapore and another country. How is it different from the previous special travel arrangements we have with other countries? Right. So um, it's different uh, on uh, several levels. Um, if you look at what we have with other countries, uh, the one uh, that you know announced today is an air travel bubble. Uh, we also have this, you know, unilateral schemes with uh, countries like New Zealand and Brunei, uh, Vietnam, um, Australia as well, excluding the state of Victoria. But that's really very uh, one track. Um, you know, in the sense that uh, we uh, welcome visitors from these countries, including leisure travellers, mm -hmm. to come to Singapore, uh, subject to certain conditions, including a COVID-19 test and all that. But um, the other way, you know, uh, those countries have not yet opened their borders uh, to uh, travellers from Singapore. So uh, you, you know, are not allowed to uh, visit those countries because they still have all these travel bans in place. Um, the other scheme we have is the uh, reciprocal green lane scheme, and that's for essential business and official travel. And for that scheme, uh, we have arrangements. Uh, China was the first that we had such an arrangement with. Uh, we also have since then inked uh, similar deals with Malaysia, um, with uh, South Korea and all that as well. But uh, again, that's not for leisure travelers, only for essential business travel uh, and official travel. Also, you're subject to a controlled itinerary. Yeah. So this air travel bubble is different. Um, it's also open to leisure travelers and it's two ways. Uh, so, you know, that means that people from Singapore can uh, visit Hong Kong as leisure uh, travelers, provided um, they, you know, do the COVID-19 PCR test. Mm -hmm. uh, they will not be subject to a quarantine. So you don't need to stay for 14 days or, you know, uh, in uh, uh, dedicated facilities, you are free to uh, move around. Some of the details are, you know, still have not been worked out yet. Um, so we are still waiting for some of uh, that to come true. Uh, but it, it won't be free for all in the sense that there will be a quota. Um, exactly what that number is, uh, both sides have uh, been quite uh, a mum on that. So those are some of the details that we are waiting for. Right. Well, building on what you said, um, with virtually no restrictions, no need uh, to quarantine and travellers needing uh, to only pass uh, the COVID-19 test, do you expect Singaporeans then to jump at the opportunity to finally, you know, go overseas? 
I think for sure they will. Um, so, you know, when we uh, had the doorstop this afternoon with uh, Transport Minister Ong Yee Kang, uh, he also uh, made the point that he expects um, demand to be uh, higher than uh, supply. Uh, the one question mark, of course, is uh, how much is this PCR test going to cost? Um, he didn't uh, uh, comment on that, uh, said that, you know, that really is a commercial decision that will be left uh, to the airlines. But I'm pretty sure that demand will be very high. If you look at some of the schemes we already have, uh, you know, we announced cruises to nowhere not too long ago. We had a story um, uh, two days ago saying that, you know, within the first five days, something like uh, several thousands of uh, bookings had already been made. Um, before that, you know, we talked about the, uh, you know, dinners and the lunches on uh, Singapore Airlines' A380. That has gotten overwhelming response and that flight is not even taking off anywhere. So clearly there is this um, pent up demand and, and people really are looking to just, you know, get away, do whatever is available. So yeah, I, I do expect that demand for this is going to be quite strong. Mm. Now, you know, we heard Minister Ong call this arrangement a small but significant step, you know, um, and this and that it could set the model for more partnerships. Now, I guess the question is, you know, a lot of people are very excited about this now, but what are the other countries do you think where this could work? So I think the one thing that's uh, been made very clear, and this has been re uh, repeatedly stressed uh, by the members of the task force as well, that it is very important when Singapore picks uh, countries to have such arrangements with that we look at the um, you know, COVID-19 situation in those countries. Uh, Singapore has to have a, a very high level of confidence in the healthcare systems there, also in you know, how they manage to uh, detect and contain cases. So I think if you look at the countries, we have the reciprocal green lanes with, for example, that's for business travel. So we have that with China, we have it with um, Brunei, South Korea, uh, Japan, uh, very soon with Indonesia as well. Um, so I think that tells you that these are the countries that the Singapore government um, has a high level of confidence in. So um, I would expect that if uh, similar air travel bubbles are going to be negotiated, it would probably be with this um, countries. I don't expect that we will do the same for, you know, countries in, in Europe, for example, or, you know, uh, because you are seeing a resurgence in the number of cases there. Uh, so I think those are the criteria that will be looked at before any decision is made on, you know, um, who else we will have uh, similar air travel uh, bubbles with. Well, Karam, it's always uh, wonderful to hear from you. We've been speaking to news editor at The Straits Times, Karam Jit Kaur. In other news, SMRC says the issues that led to widespread disruption yesterday have been resolved and trains are running normally today. In a nutshell, an attempt to fix a fault led to a chain reaction that worsened last night's train breakdown. According to SMRT's preliminary findings, it all started with a faulty power cable between Tuas Link and Tuas West road stations. The fault should have triggered a circuit breaker, but it didn't, and it caused the north, south and east-west lines power system to trip. When engineers then tried to draw power from Buena Vista intake substation without first isolating the fault, it resulted in a power supply disruption to the circle line as well. Well, yesterday, thousands of commuters on the three MRT lines endured delays and disruption, lasting some three and a half hours during the evening rush until around 10.30 p.m. Many of those who were stuck on trains in between stations were helped onto the tracks to get to the nearest platform or exit. Scenes like this, one outside Queenstown Station, were repeated elsewhere with commuters pouring out onto bus stops. The Land Transport Authority activated free bus boarding at all affected stations and increased the frequency of regularly, regular services serving those areas. Well, one commuter, Ryan Coe, told The Straits Times he spent nearly three hours in a train when it came to a halt inside the tunnel between Bukit Batok and Bukit Gombak stations. He said most commuters remained calm, but after three hours, he was tired and hungry. We're now joined by Senior Transport Correspondent at The Straits Times, Christopher Tan. Hey Chris, let's get to it now. What do you make of SMRT's response in managing the affected commuters last night, as well as explaining how the breakdowns happened? Okay, I, I think uh, it took a bit longer than we expected. Um, given that uh, this is not the first time we've had a power glitch, um, and that um, SMRT must have had uh, dozens of uh, you know, previous practice. Um, it took 
a bit longer than we thought, um, three and a half hours, and people were stuck in trains for almost as long. Um, you know, with uh, limited ventilation and you know, not knowing what or when help will come. Um, a lot of anxiety. And even one hour is long, and you talk about three hours, really, really quite trying. Um, as for the explanation, um, well, it was traced to a faulty installation in Tuas, right? And to think that something as minor as say, they're vague about what this faulty installation is, but we presume it is exposed wiring, right? If we presume that it's some form of uh, compromised wiring that lets uh, water get in or the wires to be coming into contact with uh, other metal parts uh, that causes a short circuit. <clears throat> Something as isolated as that, having a network-wide impact is unthinkable. It's really unthinkable, mm. especially after previous incidents which are similar, which were similar. And all the measures that were taken to address that, and one of them being, um, you know, segregating the power systems of the north, south, and east west line so that when something happens on the one line, it doesn't, you know, um, um, uh, transfer over to another line and crippling both lines at the same time. Um, and also, there were moves to uh, increase the resistance of uh, circuit breakers so that they are not so sensitive, uh, so that they don't trip uh, uh, with the slightest uh, abnormally. But having said that and thinking back, could it have been this raising the resistance of the circuit breakers, making them less sensitive to small vagaries of uh, power supply uh, flow that caused the circuit breaker in Tuas, which was supposed to trip and isolating that incident from the rest of the network, to, to not trip in the end. And that, that was what SMRD came up to say today, that the circuit breaker in Tuas did not trip when it was supposed to. Well, Christopher, you know, building on what you just said, and as well as, you know, SMRT's continued maintenance work, should commuters actually brace for similar breakdowns in the near future, or was last night actually, you know, a fluke, a one-off incident? I, I, th I don't think such incidents are flukes or one-off. If you look at the um, uh, past 10 years or so, uh, there has been, an, on average, one to two major breakdowns of its kind uh, per year. Uh, of course, in the last two years, uh, these have come down a lot because uh, three major components and systems have been changed, uh, namely the signaling system, the third rail power supply system, as well as the rail slippers, which are timber pieces resting, supporting the rail. All these have been changed. So in light of that, uh, the system on the whole has become a lot more uh, reliable. Uh, but, but power system, which is one of the three remaining systems to be upgraded, uh, that hasn't been done. That is ongoing. Um, so you can still expect some form of um, disruption uh, now and again arising from power-related uh, problems until they find um, a way to actually conclusively um, address this weak link in the system. Uh, we are going to see. Um, you know, occasional incidents like last night. Well, thank you, Christopher, for making time for this. We've been speaking to Christopher Tan, a senior transport correspondent at The Straits Times. In Parliament today, Senior Minister of State for Trade and Industry, Ko Po Kun, clashed with various Workers' Party MPs over the issue of minimum wage. This is the latest in debates on the subject, this time fueled by a recent Facebook post from WP Chief Pritam Singh, where he called for a universal minimum wage of $1,300. While disagreeing with the need for a minimum wage, Dr. Ko said that it would potentially disadvantage small companies, which would struggle to pay these wages. In an ideal world, of course, a high minimum wage will force industries to invest more in technology, invest in items that can raise the productivity and favour the most efficient firms without lowering overall employment. 
But in practice, there will be winners and losers. And it is our SMEs who are the most vulnerable and our most vulnerable workers who are also at risk of losing out. Dr. Koh went on to highlight that only 56,000 employees earn less than $1,300 a month, with 32,000 employed in full-time jobs. Well, Mr. Singh expressed concern with this number, urging the government to aid workers who are struggling to make ends meet. I'm sure Senior Minister of State agrees with me that we can do and we can move quite fast for these people. And I'll be prepared to, to, to work with Senior Minister of State to ensure that we can actually reach out to, to these Singaporeans as quickly as, they can, as, as quickly as the government can. Because I don't think it is acceptable that anyone, any Singaporean is earning below this number. It is simply not acceptable. And if we can do something about it in double quick time, let's do it. Other MPs who chimed in include Jameis Lim and Leon Pereira from WP, as well as PAP MPs Edward Chia and Kerry Tan. Well, moving on, parents of Singaporean children born before October 1st, but whose certified estimated delivery date was on or after October 1st, can appeal to qualify for the baby support grant. Minister in the Prime Minister's office, Indrani Raja, said more details will be available soon. There's been a wave of petitions and feedback to change the start date since last Friday's announcement of the $3,000 grant. Ms Indrani explained that the start date was decided with the aim of the scheme in mind, which is to support couples who had planned to delay their parenthood plans because of the pandemic. We would like to seek the public's understanding that specific start dates are required for any new measure or enhancement. And regardless of the effective start date, there will always be some babies who are born before it. Well, Ms Indrani reminded parents that they are entitled to other support schemes, including cash support in the form of the baby bonus cash gift, as well as government co-savings for the child development account. Minister of State for Manpower Gan Xiao Huang told Parliament that the Ministry is reviewing its guidelines to see if employers who have received warnings for illegally deploying the maids to work at a different place should get a fine instead. But there are no plans to review the maximum penalty for the illegal deployment of these workers. Ms Gan added that the number of such cases has remained relatively stable in the past few years. An update on the COVID-19 situation in Singapore. No cases in the community among the three new infections confirmed today. Today's count, though, includes one case in the dormitory and two imported who have been placed on stay-home notices upon their arrival in Singapore. The Health Ministry will share more details later tonight. In other local news, reading, studying and working in public libraries can resume from next Tuesday. The study lounge at Level 5 of the National Library Building and the Lee Kong Chien Reference Library will reopen with a three-hour visit limit. Regional libraries in Jurong, Tampines and Woodlands will be open for up to three hours as well, up from the previous 30-minute limit. For all other public libraries, the length of stay will increase to two hours. Entries will be timed to manage crowds and library users can make online bookings for their preferred slots. Bookings are limited to one per day with slots released daily for the following day. From November 2nd, 108,000 public servants will be able to access the internet securely without the need for a separate device thanks to a new remote browsing technology solution. Secure internet surfing will allow them to use their work laptops when surfing the internet for information. They will also be able to log into social media sites to make text-based posts, as well as open links directly from emails and documents. It replaces the current model of internet surfing separation, which de-links public servants' work systems from internet access to safeguard government data. Some 18,000 public servants who have to handle classified information will continue to use a separate device. Another 20,000 are not under internet surfing separation. Former domestic worker Party Liani will go ahead with her bid to start disciplinary proceedings against two prosecutors. This after being granted two weeks to, consi to consider whether she wanted to proceed. Ms Party had filed the application in June this year before she was acquitted last month by the High Court on appeal for stealing from the family of prominent businessman Liu Manliang.
quick look at the global headlines. Thailand has banned gatherings of more than five people as well as the publication of sensitive news that could harm national security. These measures under an emergency decree to end street protests. The escalating protests which have targeted the king and prime minister saw protesters camp outside the PM's office this morning to demand his removal and a new constitution. Earlier this week, protesters had also shouted at the king's motorcade in Bangkok, calling for a reduction in his powers. Over in Malaysia, opposition leader Anwar Ibrahim is set to give a statement on Friday after Malaysian police summoned him to assist investigations into a list of 121 lawmakers allegedly backing his bid to claim the premiership. Police said they had received 113 police reports about the list, which had gone viral on social media. On the coronavirus front, Italy continues to see accelerating numbers in recent days, reporting a record number of new cases since the start of the outbreak. More than 7,300 new daily infections were reported yesterday, higher than during the peak of the pandemic in late March. Meanwhile, French President Emmanuel Macron has ordered a third of France's population to be put under nightly curfew to tackle surging infection rates. About 20 million people are expected to be affected, with Paris, Marseille and Toulouse just some of the areas affected by the new measures. The curfews will take effect from Saturday and will last an initial four weeks. It's Thursday, so that means a quick check-in with our colleagues at Live for ideas on how we can spend our weekend. That's right. If you're looking for a recommendation on what to watch, why not give Korean period action film The Swordsman a try? It's our film correspondent, John Lewis, pick for this weekend. Hey, John. Welcome to the show. Now, why should moviegoers check this one out? To be frank, it's the only major release this week. Uh, it's a pretty, you know, we're having a bit of a dry spell. But that said, it's a pretty good action film that is a bit of a nostalgic throwback to the samurai and swordsman films. There are more, many of us like, I won't say all, but a lot of us like them. Oh, I see. Mm. Well, let's talk about the cast, particularly, you know, uh, the, the main actor, Jung Hyuk. Is this role a departure for him or is it more or less you know very similar to the uh the previous characters that he has played on tv and in film you've seen him in action period drama you've seen him in romance he's uh, very big in k-drama he's uh, come to singapore a few times a lot of people are familiar with him i think what's a departure for him is that he plays a very skilled swordsman so we are looking at a very high level of stunt training for him. He can't fake it, in other words. He, got a, he, he has to have the fighting skills in the swords. Oh, I see. Well, mm. thank you so much, John. That was film correspondent John Louis on his film pick for the weekend. The Swordsman opens in cinemas today. Olivia, are you a fan of dance? Sure, I am. <laughs> I've seen a few, you know, Marvel's dance reality TV mm. shows, but... Please do not, you know, ever ask me to dance. <laughs> I have uh, two left feet, but yeah. these guys, well, they sure know how to dance. Organized by the Esplanade, this year's dance festival continues to highlight the spirit of dance. We're joined by arts correspondent Olivia Ho to share more about her pick for the weekend. Hey, Olivia, now tell us more about the festival this year. Of course, it's organized in a very different way uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is the Esplanade first ever digital dance festival. It's going to run from October 12th to 30, 31st. Of course, it cannot go on um, usually because of the pandemic. So what they've done is that they've brought back a lot of people they brought up previously. Um, for instance, uh, Ming Hun, the Berlin-based Singaporean dancer. So what they've asked him to do this work called the Intervention of Loneliness, the lockdown edition. Uh, and what that is, is previously what he would do is he would get people on the street to dance, slow dance with him. It's uh, complete strangers. And he's going to try to do that this weekend over Zoom. So that's going to be quite interesting. And they're also putting on a lot of dance films. Uh, for instance, um, this Japanese dance crew, whose name I cannot say on air because it's, it's quite vulgar. But uh, I love their work. They're an extremely funny comic group and they've put on this, um, they've done this commissioned work called The Escape Game. And it's about a road trip in which they go on a journey to uh, find the missing, find these missing letters. And um, 
and they go to the forest, they've got, you know, this very vintage Volkswagen and uh, I think you can expect a lot of fun for them because I saw them last year and uh, during the street dance extravaganza full out and they were, I had such a good time. So I'm looking forward to that very much. Yeah, well, Olivia, you mentioned that this Japanese group and we know that they have participated in this festival before and this is something that the organisers are, are doing this year because, you know, it is impossible for them to actually bring in new headliners. So what are your thoughts on them, you know, revisiting previous groups that they have worked with before? Do you think it's an advantage or a disadvantage for the festival? Well, I, I must say I was a bit sorry to not have... Uh, uh, new international headliners. I can see why that would be incredibly difficult. And uh, I mean, maybe disappointing for some people, but I myself, I am very excited about seeing the Japanese dance crew doing this new commission um, because I understand it's their first full length film, full length dance film. They've done shorter dramas before, but this is their first full feature length dance film. I, I think this is, this is a chance for the Esplanade to really look into digital commissions and uh, into dance films. Well, the dance festival is definitely something you can consider this weekend. It's on now until October 31st. Olivia, thank you so much for coming on the show. We've been speaking to arts correspondent at The Straits Times, Olivia Ho. It's never too early to start the weekend with a drink. Calling all gin fans, Atlas Bar, ranked number 8 on the world's best bars list, now offers a personal gin tower experience. But what exactly does that mean? Well, <laughs> let's welcome journalist Anjali Raghuraman to share more. Anjali, please tell us more about this, the idea of the personal gin tower experience. What can guests at Atlas expect? Like Dylan said, it's one of the best ranked bars in the world. And on one end of the bar, there is a huge tower that houses 1,400 gin bottles. And this is basically your best chance to get up and close with, with those 1,000 over bottles. But um, with the experience, you're also going to get a senior bartender that's going to lead you up there. And they'll introduce you to the different styles of gin, whether it's modern contemporary, slow gin, navy strength or London Dries that most people are familiar with. And th these are gins from all over the world. So it's, and it's not stuff that's readily available on shelves here. So it's, it's really quite unique. And once you've, you've gone up to the tower, you get a beautiful look of the, of the lay of the land in Atlas, which is a stunning venue. Mm. You come back down to your table and then the bartender will customize a gin and tonic for you. So um, it could be a gin and soda, a gin and tonic with various, tonic flavors and then with a personalized garnish and so it's it's really a way to experience the gins that the bar is so well known for up close and in a very personalized and bespoke way now you know this new concept right has it is it new or has it been explored before there aren't many bars in the world that have uh, this vast a uh, collection to be honest so it is pretty uh, pretty special. Previously, they did offer it on an ad hoc basis and it depended on who was available uh, to take you up, but because they're slammed every day. Uh, um, if you're familiar with Atlas, it's impossible to get a reservation there most days, but now they've, they've made it a part of their program and it costs like $42, $42 a guest. And um, it, I think it's really helpful for, for consumers who are, whether you're an entry level gin drinker or someone who's more experienced because it's so personalized and um, you really get the, the bartender at your disposal to ask any questions you want really. Wow, very exciting stuff indeed. Well, thank you so much, Anjali. We've been speaking to journalist Anjali Raghuraman on her drinks pick as we head into this weekend. Well, that's right. No, we have heard three wonderful mm. suggestions of what you can do this weekend, Dylan. Is there a particular one they kind of gravitate <laughs> towards? Uh, I think for me, I would go and ch catch the movie that John recommended. Yeah, so I think I'm going to watch uh, The Swordsman. I don't think we have any other options because yeah. apparently Atlas is very hard to get into. <laughs> yes. And the other one, well, maybe the, fun, the, the, the dance festival. Yes, huh? yes, maybe the dance festival. Well, those are our top stories for today. For more news and videos, visit the new and refresh straightstimes.com just launched today. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. And once again, I'm Dylan Ang with Olivia Kuei. Join us tomorrow for more stories on The Big Story.